Hey folks, Happy New Year. I hope you had a fantastic Christmas and New Year. Managed to get some time to be rested and refreshed, ready for the adventure that will be 2012. Over the course of the next three months, I want to share one of my favorite stories in the Bible and learn three key principles, three thoughts from it that hopefully will inspire us and encourage us both in our own walk with God and our walk with young people in the coming months and for the rest of this year. Uh, the story is found in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24, all the way through to chapter 7. But I just want to focus on one part of the story, the beginning of the story today. And it all kicks off in Samaria, in the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom is not following God very well. The king of Samaria is not a great guy. And, uh, and so time and time again, just like now, we see the Israelites being deeply oppressed by the Aramean army. And this time, what the Aramean army have done is they've surrounded the whole of the city of Samaria. They're, they're camped about a mile outside of the city and no one can get in and no one can get out. There's no food, no water. Eventually, people are starting to starve to death. It's a terrible, terrible scene. And in the midst of this starving to death, King Joram, the, the king of Samaria, he's kind of walking around the walls and two women call out to him and they have a complaint to bring to him. And their complaint is that one says to him, look, yesterday we agreed as two friends that we would kill my son and that we'd eat him. Yes, cannibalism, we'd eat him and we did that. We killed my son yesterday, we ate him and today we agreed to kill her son and eat him but she's hidden her son and we're hungry and this is wrong she shouldn't have done this when King Joram hears this he tears his clothes he thinks this is outrageous and interestingly enough he then says right I'm going to kill that Elisha that prophet that man of God I'm going to kill him I'm going to you know, woe betide if by the end of today I've not cut that guy's head off. And that's where the scene ends. And, and we'll find out what happens next, next month, or you can read it. But the interesting thing about this is in the story we're told uh, that as the uh, King Joram is, is patrolling the, the walls, in verse 30 it says that as he went along the wall, people looked and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. They looked up and under his royal skirts, he's wearing sackcloth. And most commentators say that the reason that they think he's wearing sackcloth is because Elisha has spoken to him and said, King, you need to get right with God. You need to repent. You're living selfishly. You're living rebelliously. You're living a, a life of pride. Repent. And one of the ways that you repent is that you put sackcloth on. But the thing is... He's faking it. He's not really doing it for real. It's like an inward thing just for him, but he doesn't want anyone else to see that he's trying to get right with God because the truth is, he isn't. He's being insincere. And insincerity, dressed up as humility, kills faith. It kills our relationship with God. And so the first lesson and my first challenge and encouragement for you and for me about this year and about this month is that may God rekindle our passion and our commitment for him. Let's not be insincere. Let's not fake it. Let's not be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and King Joram who kind of put on an outward show of following Jesus and, and all that stuff, knowing God, but deep down weren't really going for it. Jesus called them hypocrites. We want to be people who are passionate for Jesus. He is the number one goal of our lives, a passion for him, that, that knowing him and, and becoming more like him is our ultimate goal before anything else, before you're a great youth leader, before you're a great pastor, worship leader, before anything else, that your primary goal this year, and for you and for me, is that we want to know God better. We want to become more like him. We want to know Christ, as Paul writes in Philippians uh, chapter 3. And so as we seek to do this, we pray that that will influence the young people, the children that we work with, that as they see us becoming more like Christ, that God is our goal, that that's what we want more than anything else, that it will spill over into the lives of others and they'll want some of what we've got and what we've got is Jesus. My prayer for you and my prayer for me 
is that we will be passionate for God this year, really passionate, going for it in every way that we can, knowing that he's the best hope that we've got and not faking it. You see, it's no wonder, perhaps, that King Joram was so mad at Elisha and wanted to get Elisha's head cut off because he's probably thinking, look, I'm wearing the, the, I'm wearing the sackcloth stuff and yet we're still seeing cannibalism happen. We're still being attacked by the Arameans. But the truth is, it just wasn't real. My prayer for my life and my prayer for yours this year is that we'll get even more real with God, that he will be our number one priority, that we will live by the greatest commandment this year, above all else, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind and all our strength, and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. But love God first and see what he will do in us and through us in all the work that we do. Wouldn't it be better that if we got to the end of this year and our main testimony was, I know God better, I'm more passionate about him, I'm becoming more like Jesus. That has to be the greatest goal for this year. May it be yours, may it be mine, and may the Holy Spirit help that to be so. So God bless you. We'll see what happens next month in this unfolding, brilliant story.